good to see Sister Pat come through the door. Amen. Amen. Sing, uh, 
We're, we're taking a little break. We're singing Christmas carols from the season. But even though we can open up our voices, open up our lungs and mouths, and give God the best that we can, amen? amen. As we sing and give glory to the Lord our God. Father God, I praise you and thank you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Genesis chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Before I read these scriptures, I, I too want to welcome my dear friend Virgil. I don't know if he remembers me or not. <laughs> so my disclaimer is probably whatever he says about me is true. <laughs> I'm just hoping he doesn't say too much. <laughs> also, um, there must have been some type of clerical error here at the church. I've checked my, um, I checked my phone, my text, I checked my email, but uh, I haven't received the invitation to wear the red robe. <laughs> <laughs> Understand Ray has his privileges, but, but that's okay. I'll remember all of you when I cut my uh, solo track. Forgot <laughs> about it. Big mistake. <laughs> Let's look at Genesis 8, verses 1 through 5. In these portions of scripture, we are reading about the story of Noah and how God worked through Noah. I'll begin reading, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God caused the wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. Also the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed. And the rain from the sky was restrained, and the water receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. In the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark rested upon the Mount of Ararat. The water decreased steadily until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. To be continued, it is the word of God. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
35, 1 through 7, and Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 14. Psalm 135, 1 through 7. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O servants of the Lord. You who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is lovely. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his own possession. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in earth and in heaven, in the seas and all the deep. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightnings for the rain, who brings forth the wind for his treasure. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. <coughs> or what man is there among you? When, he's, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask him? And everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law of the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Amen. 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 Amen.
turn your Bibles to Mark, chapter 14. Once again, I know I've been in this particular passage for some weeks, but every time I turn to uh, finish it, I sort of get hung up having my notes here. I originally planned to talk from 43 to verse 72. But I made it to verse 49. So uh, that's where we are today. Let's go to Mark 14. We're just going to read 43 through 49. I'll read uh, 48. And you can respond by reading verse 49 back to me. We are still preaching and teaching on how Jesus fulfilled the scriptures in his earthly life. Everything about Jesus was rooted and grounded in the written word of God. All that he did, all that he spoke, all that he believed, it was firmly rooted in the 66 Bible that we call the 66 books that we call the Word of God. So that's what we're studying. We shall continue that this morning. Let me begin in Mark 14, 43 through 48. Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were from the tree priests and the scribes and the elders. Now he who was betraying him had given them a signal saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away under guard. After coming, Judas immediately went to him saying, Rabbi, the word means teacher, and kissed him. They laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? 49, read. Every day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. Can God's people say amen? Amen. And then you might be seated. We are still studying the historical biblical truth that Jesus' life was dictated to the authority of God in the written scriptures alone. Because of this, we have seen the truth that Jesus' incarnation and virgin birth, his genealogy on both his legal father Joseph's side and his biological mother Mary's side, both of those were fulfillment of the written scriptures alone. We have seen how Jesus began his messianic earthly ministry by announcing himself or introducing himself to the public by the reading of scripture in which he read Isaiah chapter 61. All the supernatural miracles performed by Jesus, they were a fulfillment of the written scriptures alone. If we had time to look at it, every miracle we perform, you'll see a prediction of it in the Old Testament portion of the word of God. All of these fulfillments of scripture by Jesus clearly identified him as the promised Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the Gentiles. Jesus' teaching by parable and exposition, it was a fulfillment of the written scriptures alone. All of Jesus' interactions with others, other men, it was a fulfillment of the scriptures alone. And then the most important aspect of Christ's ministry, his substitutional death on the cross for our sins, that death on the cross and everything that immediately preceded it, it was a fulfillment of the written scripture alone. Jesus' death is his most significant accomplishment in his earthly ministry because... It is through the death of Christ all who believe are saved and justified before God. We tend to think the greatest aspect of Jesus' earthly ministry was miracles. Not so. None of Jesus' miracles saved us from our sins. 
The greatest thing the Lord ever did was allow himself to be crucified on the cross because it was a substitution. In other words, because of our sin, we should have been on that cross, but he took our place. Amen. And all the suffering he underwent as he hung on the cross, that was literally him receiving the punishment we all deserve in hell for our sin. Mm -hmm. The only thing that saves us from our sin, the only thing that can deliver us from death, hell, and the grave is the death of Christ on the cross. He was born to die. And so it's the greatest thing he did was die for us. And this death on the cross, and everything that preceded it for about 48 hours, it was all a fulfillment of the written scriptures alone. The truth of Jesus fulfilling the scripture in all aspects of his earthly ministry is perfectly complemented by Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 17, where he said this, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He came to fulfill the scripture. And so this is how the people were supposed to be able to identify that he really was the anointed of God. He really was the son of God. They could look and see how he fulfilled scripture. And so this is how it would be made known to them. And so when the Lord says, I did not come to the, uh, abolish the law of the prophets, that phrase, law and prophets, it was a Jewish equivalent of saying the Old Testament scripture. And so the Lord was very clear. He did not come to do away with the Old Testament, but to fulfill those scriptures. We therefore see Jesus fulfilling the written scriptures repeatedly in every aspect of his earthly, messianic, redemptive ministry. The scriptures are very clear that Jesus was one person with two distinct natures. He was truly God and truly a sinless male man, uh, a real sinless male man, XY chromosome man. <laughs> and I keep saying that because it seems today we don't know who's a male and who's a female, amen? amen. But he was a sinless man. He was truly God, truly sinless man, yet he lived the scripture. Yet he fulfilled all things given to him by his father according to the scripture alone. It has been my argument and it still is. If the one was truly God and truly a sinless human male man, if his earthly messianic ministry was dictated by the written scriptures alone, those same scriptures alone should be the only instrument which dictates all in the life of the church and the people of God. In other words, the written scriptures alone, the 66 books we call the Bible, they alone are sufficient for all things in the life of the church and the believer because all knowledge concerning God, everything about salvation, everything about faith, all the necessary doctrines that we must believe, and the only yardstick that reveals what is true from what is false, it is the scripture. And we believe this because if the scriptures were enough for Jesus to die and save us from our sins, those same scriptures have to be enough for us today. Amen? Amen. So if the scripture gave Jesus all he needed to save us, then those same scriptures most certainly are enough for us today to make it Amen. in every aspect of our lives. This doctrine of scripture alone, I know I've been saying this repeatedly, but I'm going to be a broken record again. Mm. The doctrine of scripture alone, it is actually stated in either the Westminster Confession of the Faith or the 1689 London Baptist Confession of the Faith, and it reads as follows. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in the scriptures or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from the scriptures unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the spirit or the traditions of men. <coughs> And as I've said before, that confession 
It is not the scripture. Therefore, it is only as good as it actually reveals what the scripture teaches. And we can look at both Old and New Testament, and we can see that they really, they hit the nail on the head when they gave us that definition. We can see scripture alone in the Old Testament. We can see it through God's charge to Israel through Moses. Right before Moses was to die, we can see this in Deuteronomy 32, 44, 47. It reads as follows. Then Moses came and spoke all the words of this song in the hearing of the people. He was Joshua, the son of Nun. When Moses had finished speaking all these words to Israel, he said to them, Take to your heart all the words which I am going to, uh, I am warning you today, which you shall command your sons to observe carefully, even all the words of this law, this book. And he gives us these last words to Israel, for it is not an idle word for you. Indeed, it is your life. So God tells Israel, what I've given you in this book, it is your life. The law of God alone, the written scriptures which God gave to Israel through Moses, it was literally Israel's life blood because it dictated every aspect of their lives. It is significant that before God gave this final message to give to the people of Israel, if you remember during their 40 year wanderings in the wilderness, God had performed many supernatural signs and wonders. He had split the Red Sea open, they walked across on dry ground, he fed them manna from heaven, gave them quail, didn't allow their shoes to wear out or their clothes to wear out for 40 years. Some of y'all would have had a hard time, amen? <laughs> Wearing one pair of shoes for 40 years. <laughs> Some of y'all got enough shoes for half a can, amen? <laughs> and I'm not gonna look at anybody when I say that. <laughs> and we'd have had a hard time making it on one pair of shoes for 40 years. God did not allow their shoes or sandals to wear out for 40 years. He gave them water out of so God performed all of these supernatural miracles before the eyes of Israel, yet when all is said and done, he did not point them to the miracles. What did he point them to? He pointed them to the word of God. Amen. The miracles were not their life, but the word of God was. Amen. We see the same principle in the New Testament, Acts 17 and 11. It reads like this, now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For well, they received the word with great eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so or true. The practice of the churches, which were established and led by the apostles. In other words, the apostles actually worshiped in these churches. They preached and taught there. The practice was to search the scriptures alone in all things relevant to God. The church, doctrine, and Christian living it was a test for them to see what was being spoken was true or false. So in the Old Testament, God tells Israel, the scriptures are your life. In the New Testament, they search the scriptures daily to see whether what was being said was true. And so we see in both Old and New that the absolute authority of God was but the scriptures alone. <clears throat> and so before I begin this morning, let me give you one more reason why what I'm preaching is such a necessity for the church today. Scripture alone, the Bible alone, is the only sure authority by which we can test what is true, what is false, what is of God, what is not of God. Let me give you one more reason before I begin the main body of the sermon today. There are many sectors of the church where the doctrine of scripture alone is not believed to be an essential doctrine of the faith. The Eastern Orthodox Church and Roman Catholicism believe the doctrine of scripture alone to be heresy or false teaching. And the reason why they conclude this is they believe ongoing revelation is being given through an infallible pope, Roman Catholicism, the Eastern Orthodox Church, they say it's coming through tradition, 
And in many of our churches today, so-called words of knowledge, prophetic utterances, supposedly from the Holy Spirit, they can come from almost anyone who claims to be under this anointing as a result of believing in these forms of continuous revelation from God. Scenarios such as the following are common in many of these circles on any given Sunday or Wednesday. A bishop, a prophet, a prophetess, or a sword anointed apostle or apostle from the Lord in Boston, Massachusetts. And they claim the Lord told them there's going to be a great revival and anointing of God that's going to fall all over the land and it's going to bring an unprecedented kingdom prosperity. Yeah. However, on the same Sunday, there's another bishop, prophet, sword anointed apostle or apostle as in Atlanta. And they say God told them America's going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> and as a result, God's going to burn America to a giant ash heap in 2019. Now one says God told them unprecedented prosperity in 2019. Somebody else got a revelation on the same day. God's going to kill everybody in 2019. Somebody in line. <laughs> well, because these things contradict one another. And so whose word is really the ongoing revelation of God, seeing that they are contradictory messages? How can you tell whose message is the truth if the scriptures alone are not the final authority in all matters? The truth, the truth is this. If scripture alone is not the final authority in all matters related to God, faith, doctrine, and life, there is no way to tell whose words are from God and whose aren't. You can't tell. And if that's true, then the Bible is virtually worthless. Because we can't read it and, and see what is true or what is false. So hopefully you can see why we need the scriptures, amen, alone to be the final judge yes. of all things. Amen. As to whether they are from God or not. One of the best ways to work our way into this doctrine of scripture alone is by looking at the principle of scripture alone in the life of Jesus. The one who was and is truly God and truly a sinless male, human, man, XY chromosome person. And we see this truth by studying how Jesus fulfilled the scriptures alone in every aspect of his life before and after his death, his burial, and his bodily resurrection from the dead. So keeping these things in mind. We want to give our attention once again to Jesus fulfilling the scriptures alone in the most significant thing he did on this earth, and that is the redemptive work of dying for our sins on the cross. And so let's pick it up in verses 46 through 49. Notice, they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew a sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? 46, every day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not see me, but this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. And so these verses are a continuation of the illegal criminal arrest of the Lord by the temple police. The arrest which would ultimately lead to Christ's death by crucifixion on a cross in just a few hours. Shortly before his arrest, the Lord had just finished an approximate one hour prayer session with his father. As his disciples struggled to stay awake and watch while he prayed, the Lord said, watch for about one hour, I'm gonna pray, you stay awake, you watch while I pray. The Bible says they just fell asleep, they couldn't stay awake. So the Lord comes back to them three times. On the third time, he understood. He knew the time had come to be delivered into the hands of sinful men unto his death. The Lord had plainly stated this fact to his disciples on many occasions. He told them, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be turned over to the hands of sinful men. I'm going to be shamefully and scornfully uh, treated. They're going to kill me. But on the third day, 
I am going to rise from the dead. He repeatedly told them that over and over and over and over. And so now the time has come. One of the occasions which he told the disciples that he was going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men and killed. It's Matthew 16, 21. It reads like this. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. And so this time of suffering and death finally came for the Lord. And so he says in Mark 14, 41, 42, it is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Tell the disciples, get up. Let us be gone. Behold, the one who betrayed me is at hand. The Bible says while he was in the midst of speaking these words, Judas the betrayer had led a gang of temple police who bore swords and clubs to where Jesus and the disciples were in the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas had already said to these temple police that the one whom he kissed was the one to seize and to take back under arrest to the priests, the scribes, and the elders. And so Judas comes up and kisses the Lord. The temple police uh, laid their hands on him and they seized or arrested them. As we saw last week, Judas betraying the Lord. It was a fulfillment of the Old Testament scripture, Psalm 41, 9, that says, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. That's the verse Jesus quoted in John 13, 18, when he told them, One of you is going to betray me. And so then he quotes Psalm 41, 9, and he lets them know the one is Judas, but as is typical, nobody really understood what he was saying. And so they seized the Lord in Mark 14, 46. And as they grabbed him and arrested him, Mark 14, 47 says, one of the disciples drew a sword and he cut off the high priest's servant's ear. John 18, 10 tells us the one who did it was Peter. He said he drew a sword and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Now, Peter was going for a whole head. <laughs> he was going for brain. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to cut no ear off. He was trying to cut a head off. <laughs> but his stroke was slightly off. And so all he got was a right ear. John 18, 10 records it like this. Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave. <coughs> and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. Then in John 18, 11, we read that the Lord told Peter, put the sword into the sheep. The cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? Then Luke 22, 50 through 51 tells us, after Peter had sliced off this uh, man's right ear, the text says, Jesus touched the servant's ear and healed him. Luke 22, 50 through 51, it reads like this. And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. That was Peter. Jesus said to him and said, stop! No more of this! And then the text said, he touched his ear and healed him. Now that was a supernatural, that, that was a tremendous miracle. Performed by the Lord. Because what it tells us is either one or two things happen. <clears throat> After Peter cuts his man's ear off, now you know they had to be blood all over the place. And so either he picked the ear up and put it back on, no scar, no stitches, none of that stuff. So either he just put it back on his head or this could have happened. Peter cuts the right ear off. The right ear is laying on the ground. And so Lord, the Lord touches the man's head, and there's a new ear there. 
So there's a good probability while the old ear is on the ground, this man walking around with a new ear on his head. Either way, this was a tremendous miracle of God performed by the God-man, Jesus Christ. Now, I can say a lot about that, but I'm, I'm only going one place today. If I was going to say something else, I would say right now, that should have let these guys know that you're not taking me. You, you can't do anything with me. If I wanted to, I could get rid of all of y'all. Now, you heal this man here. He's really letting them know what you're about to do to me. I'm giving you permission to do it. The Bible says he laid his whole life down by choice. And he told them, if you kill me, even in three days, I'll raise it back up again. He told Pilate, you have no power at all against me. What I'm going to do to you, I'm letting you do it to me. And I'm letting you do it to me on your behalf. So that should have let them know, right? This, this, is, this is not the average guy. They should have known, maybe I better back off. Because this guy puts his ears back on. <laughs> <laughs> but they did. Well, now remember Judas and this crowd of men with swords and clubs. Listen, they were all standing around watching this. Yet this obvious supernatural healing, it did not change their hearts. And it did not change their minds. Yes. They still arrested the Lord and took him to the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Judas still went and got his 30 pieces of filthy silver. Mm -hmm. None of these men who saw this supernatural act performed by the Lord and as a result cried out, Lord, what must we do to be saved? We see you put it in. They did not change one iota in their minds and hearts. But they continued in their work as they arrested Jesus. Took him to the chief priests and scribes and elders for them to conduct a premeditated grave trial in order to put Jesus to death. It even appears Malchus, the one who was healed. It didn't even change him. He continued in cooperation with Judas and the temple police to arrest and lead Jesus to a mock sham trial unto a cruel death by crucifixion. <coughs> this obvious physical miracle, which could have only been brought about by the cry of God, it did not open up the hearts of Judas. It didn't open up the heart of Malchus. It didn't open up the heart of the temple guards to understand and comprehend as a result, believe Jesus was the Son of God, the promised Messiah of Israel, and the Savior of the Gentiles. None of these sinners changed their minds about who Jesus claimed he was, but they continued in their wicked deed of arresting Jesus with the intent of putting him to death, regardless of the miracle they had just seen. This is a definitive commentary <clears throat> on how radically or totally depraved the human heart really is. Jesus. And this is why Jesus says, John 6, 44, no man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. He was talking to all of these religious leaders, these Jewish religious leaders, and I got a sermon for that next Sunday, I think. The big shots. <laughs> the television preachers. <laughs> the guys living the, in the life of the rich and the famous. <laughs> he told them, the reason when you guys can't accept me, and they knew he was doing all these miracles, he says, here's the reason why no man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. 
the essential nature of man. That's us. Which touches every part of this person, mind, body, and spirit, is as bad off as it can be. It is tainted with Judas, I'm sorry, it is tainted with Adam's sin. And it is this sin nature that we all have that enables us to commit the most hideous sins possible. It can even drive a man to commit the worst sin ever committed. And what Judas and these men are doing, it is the worst sin anyone ever committed of all time. Why? Because they were about to arrest and put to death the one who was perfect God and perfect man. The only sinless man ever to live on the earth, the sin nature was so bad, they said, we are going to kill you. Mm -hmm. First chapter of John, it says, he made the world. Came into the world. But the world never recognized him. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a lot of folks out seeking God. But I'm telling you, when Jesus came, they still didn't get it. They never got it. How many more miracles do you guys want me to work? Remember that? And they said, we want to see one more sign. What do you mean? We want one more sign. It was never enough. This is the sin nature of man. No human has committed the same sin as Judas and these temple guards. But listen, we possess the exact sin nature which led them to do what they did. Go ahead, guys. Because we all possess the exact sin nature as Judas and these temple guards, we possess a nature that can lead us to do any evil. Yeah. Yeah. Any sin possible. You see, the sin nature we possess, it makes it possible for all of us to be a Judas. It makes it possible for all of us to be a Malchus, a Temple Guard, a Caligula, look him up, a Nero, a Genghis Khan, an Adolf Hitler, a Joseph Stalin, a Mao Zedong, another rocket man, <laughs> King John Luton. See, most of us think we are better than these people. Mm -hmm. But we really aren't. Yes. Right. Because we all possess the exact same sin nature yes. of an Adolf Hitler. Yes. We possess the exact sin nature of a Miles Satan. Yes. Go to the Vanskin uh, Reform Tour and get the worst guy there. What you have in you and what he or she has in them, same sin nature. Yes. And this sin nature that we have, it leads us away from God to sin and evil. Paul talks about this sin nature in Romans 3, 10 through 12, as it is written. This is God's perspective of man. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is uh, none who does good. There is not even one. It is because we are in this condition that the Lord says in John 6, 44, no one can come to the Father unless the Father who sent me draws him. Let me talk about that word draw in John 6, 44. No one can come to the Father unless the Father who sent me draws him. The Greek word the Lord uses is helku. It literally means to drag, but not necessarily by force. It can mean to drag contrary to someone's will, but it also can mean to drag apart from force. It's the same Greek word used in Acts 16, 19, which recorded how Paul and Silas were dragged by force for the authority. It says, but when their majesty saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them off, held cool, in the marketplace before the authorities. 
So in that case, they drag him by force. It's used in James 2, 6, which speaks of a person being dragged into a court of law. You know, when you go into court of law, you ain't going by, you know. <laughs> you know, normally you ain't, you know, you gotta go to court, you know. You, 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 unless you will get some money, you're not going in there with a smile, amen? It's the same Greek word the Lord uses in John 21, 10 through 11. After the Lord is he's risen from the dead, remember he sees them out, they, they said, we're going back fishing. <coughs> and he was on the shore. They didn't know it was him. Hey, guys, you caught any fish? He said, we ain't caught a thing. He said, we ain't caught nothing. He said, well, cast your net in on this side. And it became full of fish. Then the Lord said, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. So the Bible says Simon Peter went up and it says he drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. And there were so many, the text says the net was not broken. In this case, Peter was dragging it, but it was not by force. Because fish in a net don't pull back as they do when they're caught with a line and a hook. When fish are in a net, listen now, they're being dragged they don't realize it yet until they have been caught. Let me say that again. Amen. When you drag fish in a net, they don't know they're being dragged in until they're on the boat. <laughs> now I'm going someplace. Because if you were saved, you were drugged in by the Lord. But you didn't know it until you said yes to the Lord. Am I up in the house today? So in view of this, the meaning of this particular Greek word the Lord uses is literally dragged. So he literally says in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me drags him. And I will raise him up on the last day. In John 6, 44, it does mean to drag but I don't believe it means by something with, with, the, with the drag he kicking and screaming. I'll tell you what I mean later. The reason why many are to come to Christ for salvation, the reason why they must be dragged in by God, <clears throat> listen, the reason why they must be dragged in is this. A dead man can cooperate with no one <laughs> in doing anything for themselves. Do I need to say that again? Oh, yeah. yes. Dead folks don't help you get anything to come. Well, All they do is lay there and ride. This reminds me of a personal account written by Wilfred Owen. He was one of the great war poets who came out of the First World War. It was him and several others, Siegfried Sassoon, Robert Graves, Edward Thomas, Isaac Rosenberg. So I know you guys are going to run home and get you guys a copy of the poets of the Great War. Amen. I'm a geek. That's what I do. I read your stuff. But he writes a poem about his experiences in the trenches of World War I about death. And he says this. It's a letter he wrote to his mother in 1970. He says this. He says, my own dear mother, I suppose I can endure cold and fatigue and the face-to-face -face death as well as another. But extra for me is the universal pervasion of ugliness and the distortion of the dead bodies whose unburied bodies stand outside the dugouts. He says, in poetry, we call them glories. He says, but to sit with them all day and all night, and to come back a week later and to see them still sitting there in motionless groups, that is what zaps the soldierly spirit. What all was saying is that, that in World War I, they had trench warfare. The British over here, the French on the other side in trenches, and there was a section of line between the two trenches called No Man's Land. <clears throat> now, if you reach it out in the No Man's Land, that's where you die. Quickly. Well, uh, you had enemy over here and the other enemy over here, 
And a lot of guys got killed on no man's land. And so because if you got out, if you got out to trench to bear him, you became part of no man's land and just let him stay there. Now in the wintertime, when it gets cold, they would just freeze up exactly as they got killed. Frozen stick. And they would stay like that until thought time came. And what he's saying is what really got him is he said he would see these men in all kind of distorted positions as when they were killed. It's winter time. And he says they're in the same position all day and all night. They don't do anything. They would remove them from the line for a week. They come back to the line. And he says, guess what? The same thing. Same motionless positions. Why? Because the dead do nothing. They stay there. And so it is a poignant eyewitness account attesting to the fact that the dead do nothing except lay in the same position until someone drags them into a grave. In the spiritual sense, the scriptures are clear. Man, in his unredeemed state, is spiritually dead. The Bible says man is dead in what? His trespasses and his sins. Therefore, just as, in the, as the dead in the natural realm do nothing for themselves in any capacity, neither can those who are dead in trespass and sins. They are motionless until someone comes and does something with them, to them, for them, through them. We read of this in Ephesians 2.1 where Paul described the spiritual condition of the Ephesians before they were saved. And he says this, and you were <coughs> dead in your trespasses and sins. Many, probably most people believe when you came to God, you had something to do with it. You felt you met God halfway and he kept the other halfway. Dead folks don't come halfway. Dead folks stay all the way down here. For anything to be done with a dead man, somebody got to come all the way over here to him. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Yes. And if you are saved today, it's because God did it all. Yes. He convicted you. He saved you. He regenerated you. He changed your mind. He turned you around. He died for your sins. He rose from the dead. Yes. If you know the Lord, you did nothing. Yeah. You didn't earn it because you sinned. Most folks think we meet God halfway, or 30 percent man, 70 percent God. Then I repented and came to the Lord. <laughs> Most Christians believe when a person is saved it's because they move themselves towards God, as God was reaching out to them. Let me ask you a question: When have you ever reached at a dead person and they reach back? <laughs> First of all, they did. You wouldn't stand in the room. <laughs> when did you reach toward a dead person and they reached out and grabbed your hand? You were dead in trespasses and sins. And God reached out and snatched you wherever you were. He dragged you. He pulled you in. Therefore, to him goes all the glory. Yeah. 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 It is because of this in order for anyone to come to Christ and the salvation. The Father, according to his own will, plan, and purpose, he drags them in. But you don't know you were dragged to the end of the boat. Most people don't like that doctrine because they say, well, that's God saving somebody against their will. I'm a deer hunter. I've killed a lot of deer. And after I kill them, I field dress them. Good. And drag them back to my truck. I've never had a dead deer fight with me and get me back to the truck. <laughs> Am I in the house? Yeah, I ain't never had a dead deer out there. I always got to out. He did. 
I'm dragging it back. Ain't nobody, and it wasn't nothing kicking the screen and say, I don't want to go in your truck. <laughs> when I came to Christ to be saved, I didn't say, Lord, I'm going to get saved, but it's against my will. I really don't want to do this, but you're forcing me to. So I repent of all my sins, and I place my faith in you because I believe you died for my sins according to the scripture, were buried, and then rose on the third day. Now, when I came to the Lord after being dragged by God, I was afraid. I ain't fought back. I ain't did nothing. All I did was say, yes, God. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Ain't no kicking. Ain't no screaming. I'm ready. This aspect of our redemption in which the Father drags those who he gives to the Son, apart from them kicking and screaming. I think it's a mystery only comprehended by God. If someone has worked out this, I'm willing to listen, but I must say I have a lot of free doubts. For I really believe some aspects of our salvation are a mystery to us, but known only and understood by the omniscient mind of God. God dragging sinners who are dead in their trespassing sins to a son of salvation, apart from forcing people against their will to get saved, is, is too deep of a mystery for my mind. But yet I believe because my conversion experience tells me it is true. God dragged me. He dragged me. But I know to drag me. Keep telling I have my own life planned out. Playboy. Yeah. <laughs> Rich. CEO. Something tremendous. Something great. First black game bond. Something. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's how I saw my life. Well, while this was happening, if other stuff happened in my life, it wouldn't let the playboy aspect work out. Amen. Amen. <laughs> other stuff happened. I just, I, I couldn't, I, I could never, what I, I just couldn't do it. But see, God was dragging me. I told y'all, when I was at Akron U, I, I just I show the church today. Brother he went with me. But when I was at Akron U, Now this was kind of after, this was after, like I said. And so I believe, I, I really believe the Lord had shown me this particular course of study to take. And I didn't know why. Well, I didn't know why. I just didn't want to accept that. Because it would help me out in my preaching and teaching. And so I believe the Lord moved me to be a history man. And you know me, you can't make no money doing that, God. <laughs> So I got into the history department. Of course, I did very well in it. And I said to myself, you know, this ain't working because I can't make no money doing this. And so I dropped all my history courses. No, I dropped every history course I had except one and took all business courses. At the end of that semester, after God got through with me, I had to drop every business course. I had one left. Guess which one it was? <laughs> See, God would drag me all along. Way before I got saved, the Lord was dragging me. But I didn't know it. And I now know it's true because I'm now in the boat yeah. with Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. unto eternal separation and outer darkness, where they will be weeping, wailing, and the gnashing of teeth. The biblical evidence that God was doing is Judas and these others. Seeing this man get his ear put back on his head, but it changed nothing for them. 
God has to do it. See, this is true. There are no other things we can do to entice the radically depraved hearts and minds of sinners to turn to Jesus in repentance and faith unto salvation. They must be drawn by Christ through the Father, through the Spirit of God. When we give the gospel. We give the call. God does the drawing yes. and the dragging. <laughs> if it's because of this, we'll never win anybody to Christ through marketing schemes. Giving away free stuff that appear, appeals to Generation X. Let's turn the worship center into a rock and roll concert. Let's turn it into one hip hop. Let's turn it into rhythm and blues. And then when men see we're the church, but we're almost just like the R&B, then men will be saying, no, they won't. They'll come to church to hear R&B. <laughs> and you'll have a bunch of R&B. <laughs> Why you put a man's shoe? They say just like the high play, something like that. <laughs> 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 so that's your man. Man. They, 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 they can make you funky, just like Jimmy Brown. <laughs> man, we go there and we have a funky good time. <laughs> Even got a guy on the trombone named Fred. <laughs> y'all don't know what I'm talking about, do y'all? <laughs> Guess what? That won't change anybody's heart. To turn to Jesus. Why? Jesus said that no one would come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This is why when we witness, listen. This is why when we do evangelism, we must trust in the power of of God to save. Yes. It is not a clever argument. It's not trying to deal with a man and just trying to get into where he's at. It's by the power of the Spirit of God. We pray that God will open up the heart and the mind. We witness, but God has to draw. God has to save. 48, 49, and Jesus said to them, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against the robber? Every day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not see me, but this has taken place to what? To fulfill the scripture. Some of the most powerful words Jesus ever gave me. He asked his temple guards, you could have arrested me a long time ago. I was in the temple every day teaching. Why didn't you roll up on me then? And he said, the reason why you did it but the scriptures had to be fulfilled. Listen. Jesus had to die the way the scriptures said he would in order for a redemption to be real and redeem us from our sins. What I'm saying is you cannot disconnect your salvation from the holy written scriptures. Because in order for Jesus to die and save us from our sins, he had to do it exactly as it was recorded in the scripture. That's why we spend so much time over here, more than singing, shouting, dancing. That's why we spend so much time in this. Amen. Because you can't know Jesus apart from this. Amen. And you can't separate him from this. You can't know him unless it's through this. And even after you're saved, you can't grow in him unless it's through this. One goes with the other. To have one, you need the other. And when you get one, you want the other. What? You want this. You want to hear the word of God. Everything Jesus did, it was to fulfill the scriptures. Now, let me, let me call and say this. If you can read Jesus say that this had to happen, Fill the scripture. If you can read that and still not be convinced of the sufficiency of the scripture alone for you, I don't know what else can be done for you. But I will tell you this. When you believe in the insufficiency of scripture, it's to your own spiritual hurt and ruin. It's going to ruin you spiritually, it's going to ruin you emotionally, it's going to ruin you 
physically. I say this because apart from trust and the total sufficiency of scriptures alone for all things in the Christian life, you are destined for confusion, you are destined for false hopes, you are destined to be deceived by Satan and all of his bishops, prophets, prophetesses, and sword anointed apostolesses. You are headed for total disappointment. Why? Because nothing anybody says can produce in your life what God produces in the life of the believer through his word, which abides forever. As Isaiah says in Isaiah 48, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen? Yeah. It is serious spiritual disease and guide them in their life that is temporary or coming from a huckster. When you have the living, breathing word of God that abides forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. The most important thing Jesus did, he did it while fulfilling the scripture. Verse 50, and they all left him fled. You know, in 14, 27 through 31, he had already told the disciples, in about an hour, all you got to believe in for Satan. Peter bragged, not me. Everybody else will, but not me. I'll die for you. <clears throat> Text says they all fled, just as Jesus said. Now, why is that? I'll tell you why. Everything Jesus says is true. Everything he has said is going to come to pass. Everything he spoke about salvation is true. Everything he spoke about hell is true. Everything he spoke about his second return is true. Everything he said going to happen to you if you accept him is true. Everything he said if you reject him is true. Never count on Jesus being wrong in anything. Amen? Amen. The disciples said, not us. That's everybody else. But not us. Jesus said, no, you will in an hour. You're going to go. You're going to go. You go. No, Lord. <laughs> In an hour, they all fled. Mm. Don't bet against Jesus, said they? Yeah. And you will come out on the wrong end of the state. Yeah. The greatest work Jesus accomplished during his earthly ministry was his substitutionary death on the cross for our sins. This greatest work of Christ was accomplished by him fulfilling scripture alone. Every day I was in the temple teaching, and you did not see me, but this has taken place. Fulfill scriptures once again. If Jesus can accomplish the greatest thing in his life by fulfilling scripture alone, they don't tell me the same scripture is not enough for you and me today. It is. Amen? Amen. One more time. Amen. 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 The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for those who man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from the scripture unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelation of the spirit or the traditions of men, the word of God is sufficient for you and for me and for the church of Jesus Christ in all things. Live by it, breathe by it, die by it, and you'll be all right at the end of the day. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray.